Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on Ohio EPA's uh, DMTF VW grant program for level two electric vehicle charging stations. My name is Alauden, and I'm joined by my colleague, Carolyn Watkins. I hope you stay with us till the end, uh, whether you're a municipality, an EV vendor, regional planning organization, uh, we have something of value for everyone, hopefully, and this, uh, this should provide you a lot of perspective on this grant program. Uh, throughout the webinar, please go ahead and type in any question that you may have in the chat box, but we will answer as many as we can here towards once we're done with the narrative portion, we'll do Q&As at the end, but please keep them coming in throughout the webinar. Uh, if we don't get to your question during this webinar, we will email you a response later or we'll put it in our frequently asked questions document and post that on our website. So please do ask those questions. And then uh, if you do need to leave or if uh, you otherwise miss something on one of the slides, uh, worry not. Uh, or if you get inspired and think of others in your professional circle who couldn't be here today uh, but would benefit from this information and you want to share it with them, please remember that we will be uh, posting this PowerPoint uh, recording of, of the webinar and the frequently asked questions document on our website uh, here, hopefully by the end of um, uh, this week. So around July 17th, we should have it up there. So with that, uh, some of you have heard this before, but uh, you know, given we always have some first timers, we always like to start with a quick review of the overall VW program and Ohio's approach to implementing it. So in 2016, uh, United States Department of Justice and the state of California sued VW um, and their associated companies, uh, the alle alleging that uh, VW installed these defeat devices on certain diesel vehicles. So um, in Basically, the devices would be activated during emissions testing and to make it look like they were complying with the law on the emissions limits, when in fact they were actually emitting significantly more nitrogen oxides uh, by some estimates from anywhere from nine to 40 times the allowable amount of nitrogen oxides. Uh, in Ohio, that excess, uh, those excess emissions uh, amounted to about 350 tons. Uh, emitted in Ohio from these vehicles that were that were registered here. So VW reached a $14 billion settlement, uh, still remains one of the, uh, the largest uh, automobile uh, settlement uh, in the history of our, our country uh, related to emissions. And uh, most of that money was set aside for Volkswagen to buy back or repair uh, these diesel vehicles that were out there. Um, and they set aside $2 billion uh, for a wholly owned subsidiary of Volkswagen called Electrify America. Some of you are familiar with them. They um, have been putting electric vehicle chargers uh, trying to connect uh, Ohio, uh, excuse me, try to connect the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. And then lastly, $2.7 billion was set aside um, for states uh, to remediate the environmental eff effects of the excess nitrogen oxides that were emitted there from these vehicles. Of that amount, Ohio received $75 million um, based on the 16,000 plus VW and Audi diesel vehicles that were registered here. Um, the settlement allowed a state to allocate a maximum of 15% of that settlement amount for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So that is what Ohio chose to do. So we allotted the maximum we could, which in our case translates to $11.25 million for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, I do wanna point out that uh, on the other side of the settlement, which is the fleet vehicle set aside, if you will, uh, electric vehicles are eligible in almost every category there as well. So electric vehicles feature strongly in Ohio's VW program. So all of this is in Ohio's VW plan on our website. Um, there's a quick look at the 26 counties that are eligible for funding under the VW program. Um, the VW trust settlement uh, laid out requirements for how these funds could be used and where they could be used. And in Ohio, um, so these included like criteria like overall air quality, non-attainment, areas that disproportionately suffered from the pollutants of uh, diesel exhaust, as well as where these VW or Audi vehicles were registered. So based on all of those factors, these are the 26 counties that Ohio uh, determined would be eligible for the VW program. 
So before we get into the specifics of this RFA for level two charging, um, I just wanted to share with you our overall approach. Uh, we're not saying that this is the only way to approach things. Uh, we're saying that this, uh, from what we've listened and learned and listened and learned, that this is what we thought was the best approach to go with. Uh, Ohio will be spending its VW uh, electric vehicle charging dollars on publicly available locations only. And we'll talk a little bit more about that down the, a little bit in a few minutes. Uh, the applicants could be government or non-government. Um, we view level two charging um, as meeting local demand where it already exists, as well as uh, building awareness of electric vehicles and the possibilities of owning an electric vehicle, even where the demand may not be that high. Uh, but we treat it as sort of a two pronged approach. So where there's demand already and we notice a lot of that, uh, we hope to meet that demand and also uh, where there aren't that many electric vehicles, um, uh, but you're in an eligible county, and maybe your efforts, we could help with a, a partner with the local community, put a few chargers in. So when more people see these chargers, they're more likely to feel comfortable to purchase an electric vehicle. And then on the DC fast charging locations, our approach is primarily to help strengthen uh, intrastate travel. So long distance travel within the state of Ohio and to neighboring states as well. Uh, but we'd like to fill the gaps for DC fast charging along uh, the designated EV charging corridors so that um, uh, Ohioans will feel comfortable getting in their cars, the electric vehicles and traveling long distances as well. Uh, and we'll talk about the DC fast charging RFA um, a little later. So here's a look at the overall timeline that we have been proceeding with. Uh, back in the winter of 2018-2019, uh, many of you, Carolyn and I met with uh, when we went out and had uh, meetings associated with all 26 priority counties. And basically what we hoped to do was before, rather than roll out a program and tell you what the rules are, we did kind of this like this listening tour, if you will, and asked you, our stakeholders, how you would like us to set up um, this program in Ohio. Uh, we took your input and, and as you see the RFA, you'll see that a lot of what you told us we've actually built in to our program. Uh, then last year, we also worked uh, with DAS uh, and with ODOT on two very important um, sort of developments, if you will. One is the state term service contract with DAS. Another one is an EV charging study through Drive Ohio. And we'll talk about that in the next uh, couple of slides here. Uh, the level two EVSE RFA, this is where we are today. Uh, this opened on July 1st, as you know. And then uh, ODOT is coming out with their own state government locations um, RFP here very soon in the next couple of weeks. And again, there's a slide dedicated to that, but I want you to be able to make the distinction. There's Ohio EPA's RFA for level two charging stations. So we're doing grants. ODOT is doing a separate RFP to secure one vendor to install charging stations in a number of state government locations. Some of those locations will be funded by these VW dollars, others will not. So it's important that you make a distinction between these two RFA, RFPs, if you will. And then down the road uh, further this year, uh, later in this year, we hope to still get out a RFP um, uh, for electric, our electric vehicle, uh, excuse me, electric school bus pilot project, uh, maybe close to the end of this year. And then we're hoping to roll out uh, our RFA for DCFC uh, fast charging, uh, as I mentioned earlier, early in 2021. So those are our tentative timelines for how we're going about this. So I mentioned uh, our sister agency, Ohio Department of Administrative Services. We're very grateful to them for providing this service. Um, if you're a public entity out there, you already are familiar with state term service contracts. Uh, they used to be for other kind of low cost repeat items, if you will, that you would use in your offices and so on. But uh, now, uh, thanks to them, you have one for procuring electric vehicle charging equipment as well. And uh, these are available for public entities to use with or without VW funds. So while we were helping them get to this point and put that out there as a service to uh, public entities in Ohio, uh, we want you to understand that this isn't necessarily tied to just receiving a VW grant. You could just be outside the 26 counties or you could maybe your proposal doesn't receive funding. You can still receive um, the, use this contract 
that's already um, you know vetted, that's already gone through public bidding process and so on. You can literally pick up this contract and use it. And if you have any questions about that, you can contact Donna Davies. As it mentions, there are like I believe 13 bidders had applied and seven of them are currently under contract with Ohio DAS. Uh, we did want to point out to you here that since this happened, originally we were going to do this and then roll out our level two RFP, RFA right away. Uh, but since there's been a, a significant sort of time gap between these two, other vendors have, you know, um, sort of now built a presence in Ohio. They reached out to us uh, about participating in our VW program as well. So what we did was we adopted the middle ground approach here as well. On one hand, we didn't limit an applicant to only using one of the seven vendors under the AS contract. But on the other hand, uh, further on, you'll see that in our ranking state system, uh, will if you do use one of these contracts and if we have to like use a tiebreaker, then we would give a higher priority to proposals that use one of these contracts. So um, you can use someone else. <clears throat> excuse me. You don't have to use one of the seven vendors, but if it comes to a tiebreaker between ranking and there are many, there are like nine ranking factors, so it may not even come into play, but if it does, then just know that there's a higher uh, priority for those that are using one of these uh, 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 Ohio DSS EVSE contract. Now, the other important heads up, and this is specifically to those of you that are vendors on this webinar, that as I mentioned earlier, Ohio ODOT is the lead agency that is going to take, use the funds that we've set aside as part of this RFA to install level two chargers at multiple state agency locations. These are some ODNR parks and lodges, certain ODOT garages, Ohio Department of Public Safety's most busy um, BMV location. So there's a, there's a list of locations. And so we're hoping to fund the subset of those locations that are within the 26 count, uh, priority counties using VW dollars. And ODOT will essentially issue an RFP to then rec uh, receive bids from vendors uh, and they will select one vendor to install all of these charging stations at all of these locations. So um, if you're interested in competing uh, for that, I mean, first of all, the EV study is at drive.ohio.gov. Uh, the locations are listed there. Um, the RFP will be posted at the link that's there. I'm not going to read the link uh, to you. Um, and also there's another link for Drive Ohio where you can sign up for the e RFP announcement so that you get notified um, that you get notified when the RFP is actually released uh, for people to bid on. So uh, we'll of course post this um, PowerPoint on the website. So if you don't, you know, write down the link uh, completely right now, don't worry about it. Or you can always email us and we'll be happy to send that link to you as well. But we would encourage you to participate in ODOT's RFP as well and see if you are the vendor selected to install uh, these chargers in all of these state uh, government locations. So with that, I'm going to move on to the specifics of this RFA. Um, as you know, uh, we opened uh, the request for applications period on July 1st, and the important date to remember here is that it closes on September 30, 2020. So I did want to point out to you all that there's no virtue in submitting your application early. Uh, although, uh, you know, neither Carolyn or I are fans of receiving 100 applications in the last week when the deadline is, but at the same time, we're saying if you submitted one tomorrow, it doesn't necessarily get you a higher priority or anything like that. So we intentionally allowed for a three month period so that you can invest the time and energy to create those relationships between the different entities that have to be involved to successfully deploy an electric vehicle charging station and see it kind of operate uh, effectively and, and truly benefit everybody involved. So that's why there's time built in. But at the same time, please make sure that you, um, you know, sort of get get your work done ahead of time and then submit the application in reasonable time uh, all the way up to the deadline. So again, important dates, July 1st we opened. Uh, this is the second of the two webinars, so we're th we thank you again for being here. We'll be posting the Q&A document or the FAQ document. Uh, please, um, you know, check those maybe once a week or something just 
you know, a reminder every Friday or every Monday to check those to see if there are any updates. Uh, I mentioned the applications are due September 30th at 3 p.m., not at 5 p.m., but at 3 p.m. Please keep that in mind. And um, and also I'll mention here that it'll be one, your application will be one PDF file emailed to one email address and it needs to be in there by three o'clock. So again, I would, and we'll mention the email address uh, closer to the end of the webinar, but please uh, remember to not wait until 2.48 or 2.50 p.m. on that day to hit send because as you all know, anything happens with emails and servers and so on. So please remember that that's the deadline and we're hoping to make a grant award announcements around January 15th uh, of 2021. Okay, so remember uh, in terms of funding distribution, this is for level two only. DC fast charging will be a separate offering early 2021. Um, if you're part if you're inclined, you know, you have a location that has you want to put both types of chargers, then we would encourage you to participate now and later. So unlike previous uh, VW grants on the fleet side, you know, where if you got a grant this year, then un until you completed the project, you weren't you know eligible to apply again. Um, just because you got a grant for level two charging, it does not impact negatively your ability to apply for DCFC uh, grants when we make those available. So please apply for both. Uh, there's um, a total of $3.25 million we've made available. Uh, remember the slide on ODOT's RFP for state government locations? Well, that's the $250,000 that you see there that we've set aside for those chargers. The rest of the $3 million is split evenly between 26 counties. You know, our ideal scenario, our, our, our dream is that we are able to, through this offering, invest up to $115,000 in each of these 26 counties to deploy level two chargers. So up to $115,000 for each of the 26 counties uh, to deploy uh, level two chargers. Um, so that's why based on that, we would recommend that um, a, if you're a potential site host in any of these 26 counties, please apply. Like, don't let anything be a deterrent to you applying. Uh, you know, we are interested in putting chargers where uh, there's a demand, but we're also interested in putting chargers where they may not be chargers right now. So please, please, you know, go ahead and do apply. If you're a vendor, uh, we would recommend that you spread your outreach outside of like the largest three or four most populated counties in the state to other counties as well, to the rest of the 26 counties or as many of them as you can as well, because we are looking to make this investment in each of the 26 counties. Uh, having said all of that, um, as program administrators, we reserve the right to, you know, to adapt the program as we see fit. We can extend the application deadline if we, if we see the need to. We can reach out to an individual applicant and ask for more information even after the deadline if we needed to complete our review. Um, we may reach out to an applicant and negotiate, uh, you know, with them to modify their project scope, you know, do more chargers, do fewer chargers, you know, or how many, how much funding. Um, we would uh, choose to make a full or a partial or no grant award at all to a particular applicant. And uh, we also reserve the right to re reallocate, if you will, uh, funds from one county to another if, uh, you know, we so uh, desire to do so based on the applications we receive. So with that, um, how much funding is available, right? So unlike some other states, we have, um, you know, attached the amount of funding to the actual charger port, not to the site location, not to the number of chargers, but to the actual number of charger ports that will be made available as part of your participation in this program. So some key words that I want you to pay attention to on the slide. The first one being at a government owned property as opposed to at a non-government owned property. These words are straight out of the settlement and that means that the percentage that you're eligible for is dependent on the piece of ground that the charters stand on. So if the charters are physically located on land that is government owned, then you may be eligible for up to 100% of the costs 
or 7,500 or 15,000 per uh, you know, single port or dual port charger, whichever of the two is lesser. And if those chargers are gonna sit on a non-government owned property, then the maximum you're eligible for is 80% of the eligible costs um, and or 75 or 15,000 again, uh, whichever one is, is less. So the key is so an important word uh, again to remember there is eligible costs, not the total project cost, but the cost, the portion of those total costs that are eligible under the VW program. And there are slides further down and the RFA goes through great detail about what costs are eligible and what costs are not. So if you're following along um, using your RFA document printed out or on the screen in front of you, you'll see us uh, go through some of those as well. So eligible costs is an important term to uh, remember. In the third part to remember is the lesser of the two. So it's either 100% of the eligible cost or 80% of the eligible cost, depending on government, non-government, or it's 7,500 per single port and 15,000 per dual port charger that gets installed, whichever one is less. Okay. So some key overall considerations before we get into um, like some specific sections of the RFA, I wanted to you know, give you a big picture of this particular RFA. Uh, this is a reimbursement grant. Therefore, an applicant must have the ability to, you know, say you apply, you get selected to receive the grant, we sign a grant contract with you. You have to have the ability to go ahead and build the project. And when you build the project and you submit the reports that come along with it, and finally, when you, you will complete the project, submit a closing report and request reimbursement at that time. So you have to be able to front your portion, like the, 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 the project cost up until that point. So please remember that it's a reimbursement grant. So in rare instances, we'll sometimes do a sort of a reimbursement, a partial reimbursement based on um, you know, certain key milestones, but that is a very, very rare exception. So do be prepared to foot the cost of this project upfront and get reimbursed. Uh, the second important thing, you'll hear me say this many times, you've got to be in an eligible location. There's a slide uh, that talks about it. Um, the chargers themselves, ha themselves have to be publicly available, whether they're on private land or government land, that is not relevant, but they have to be publicly available, meaning available to members of the public most, if not all of the time. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, you also um, want to make sure your charges are purchased, not leased. The word purchased is specifically mentioned again in the VW settlement. I know that in some cases leasing makes sense, uh, but unfortunately the, the uh, settlement language makes it clear that they have to be purchased. Excuse me. Um, our chargers that are funded by VW dollars have to be networked. Uh, we're very keen on making sure that our users can find them um, through the different apps online. And we're also very interested in the data that we look, we're hoping to collect uh, by this investment. So they have to be networked. And then they also have to be covered by a five year uh, manufacturer's warranty. Now we understand that rarely is equipment ever come, does it ever comes with a five-year warranty. We understand that this is an additional cost that you will incur and we're asking you to incur that cost, but we're also making that cost eligible for reimbursement. So five-year equipment warranty and a five-year service contract. Because again, uh, talking to stakeholders, we've learned that the chargers that receive no uh, little to no care and often are, are, are out of service uh, early into you know, deployment are the ones that don't come with a service contract. So again, we're asking you to get a service contract, but we're also making that cost eligible, unlike some of the other states that, you know, that chose not to make that eligible, an eligible cost. And then finally, we expect you to operate, maintain and report on the usage of that charger for five years from the initiation of operation, not five years from when you get the grant, for five years from when you are ready to start receiving uh, electric vehicles to charge them. Uh, from that point on, we would uh, we're asking for five years of reporting. Rest assured that it's pretty straightforward reporting that should not be a significant burden and that shouldn't be a deterrent for you to apply. It would be information that you as a site host or a vendor would want anyway for to collect. So 
Uh, moving on, uh, as you know, any funding program uh, will have uh, thresholds to meet. The first threshold always is, are you eligible, right? If you're eligible for the program, then you can apply. And then is, if you're eligible, is your application or proposal complete? Uh, and if it's complete, then it gets reviewed and ranked. And thirdly, is your application competitive, competitive enough to be funded? So generally, those are your three uh, parameters, if you will. So um, in terms of eligibility, there are four criteria in our program. So we're going to take a quick look at them to make sure that you are eligible to apply uh, or your project is eligible um, you know, for grant funding under the VW program. The other thing I'll point out that it says section three on the slide. So in every slide where it says a section, that section number corresponds to the section to that section in the RFA document as well. So if you're following along with the RFA document open in front of you, that's uh, you know certainly a good idea for you to do so. So the first eligibility criteria is to be in an eligible county. Uh, we showed you the map earlier, and here's the table that lists the 26 counties, and there are no exceptions to this requirement. Let me say that again. There are no exceptions to this requirement. I'm sorry if you're outside one of the 26 counties, you're not eligible for VW grant funding, although that also by extension means that you probably breathe cleaner air than the people that live in one of these 26 counties. So um, even the state government facilities that I've mentioned earlier that were being funded from this grant, uh, we will be funding the locations that are within these uh, 26 counties. Uh, the other thing to uh, point out is for the purposes of initial scoring and ranking, uh, we're not going to make a distinction between the first and second priority counties. So whether your county is listed on the left uh, two columns or the right two columns, please go ahead and apply for this grant. And finally, I mentioned this earlier, uh, it's up to us as, as grant administrators to you know, reallocate, uh, you know, unspent funds from one county to another based on demand or based on any reasons that we see fit from a program administration standpoint. So once you're in an eligible county, uh, the next question is, are, is your site itself eligible, right? So to encourage as many applications um, as we can get, uh, we have set like yours as, as a site host, uh, you can be a public or a private entity. Um, but your charging station, as I mentioned earlier, has to be publicly available. And we set publicly available at 16 hours a day, including prime business and daylight hours. So you can't like set it like from eight o'clock at night to six o'clock in the morning and use it in the daytime for your use for your employees and so on. You can't do that. It has to be the main 16 hours of the day uh, and it has to be publicly available. I'll point out to you that many other states actually require 24 seven access, uh, but we didn't. This was also one of the features based on stakeholder input that we received when we did our outreach meetings. So we limited down to 16 hours. So, uh, but I will say that if your site is available 24 seven, then you're going to get a higher priority. If it's 16 is the minimum, but if you are open or accessible 24 hours, then you get a higher priority. The other exception to the 16 hours is parks. Uh, as you know, in Ohio's winters, um, you know, you parks are open uh, from generally from like sunrise to sunset. And uh, in winters in Ohio, you sometimes you don't get 16 hours of, of, of uh, daylight. So we understand that. And for parks, we're willing to make the exception uh, for it to be whatever the daylight hours are uh, that the park is is open. So what is eligible? Um, you know, what locations? I mentioned parks already, shopping centers, libraries, government offices, airports, sporting arenas, any of those, you know, kind of high volume, high traffic locations are certainly eligible. Uh, we also received a few questions about um, that. I'll go ahead and just throw out there. Hotels, we were asked. Uh, we have decided that hotels are eligible. Uh, however, you're going to need to make a strong case for how you're going to make sure that these are going to remain publicly available and not just limited to hotel guests. Because a lot of hotels, I understand, uh, they don't charge for charging, but they require you to come in and get a password or a key from the front desk. And, and they like to limit, rightfully so, they want to limit those to their guests. And when you're paying for it yourself, you're 
totally welcome to do that and, and, and rightfully so. But when you expect uh, Ohioans to pay for your charger, then we'd like for those charters to be available for all members of Ohio's public to be able to use. So hotels are eligible, but you've got to make a case in your application for how you're going to make sure it's truly publicly available. The other question we got was street parking. Street parking is also eligible. Like think of an EV charger where you think of a parking meter on a, on a, on a parking spot on a, along a street. But please also understand that you're going to need to make a stronger case than a garage or a lot on how you're going to protect uh, that charger from vandalism or from otherwise being damaged in some way. So just keep that in mind um, as well. Uh, what's ineligible are parking facilities um, that serve a single business or single landlord. So if you're a multi-unit dwelling, an apartment building, and you want to put in electric vehicle charging for your tenants, great, we're happy you're doing that but we just don't think that that's publicly available so it wouldn't be eligible for vw funding similarly for workplace charging uh, you're an employer you want to make um, uh, electric vehicle charging available to your employees um, that would not uh, be eligible again for vw funding again we encourage you to do that it's a great idea it's a great service but it's not eligible for vw funding so therefore if you're one of those single business locations right um, can you still apply? And, and, and uh, we would say, yes, you can apply, but based on where you locate it, based on what policies you have in place, we would need to be convinced that that is truly uh, being placed and will be used by members of the public, including you know customers who frequent your business or even anyone else. Uh, you would need to demonstrate that you're going to, how you're going to make sure that it's truly available to members of the public and not, tr not really a service to your own employees, uh, if you will, using public funds. Um, another one to call out is hospitals. Um, we have decided that hospitals will be eligible for these uh, for VW funds for electric vehicle charging, provided that these are chargers that are on the visitor or the patient parking side. And so if they're there, and again, if you have uh, policies and procedures in place to ensure that your staff aren't the ones that are kind of monopolizing uh, these uh, charging stations, then those would be eligible. But if you've got a dedicated staff parking lot uh, for your hospital staff, then those would not be. Again, we encourage you to put those in. We just wouldn't be able to use public uh, dollars uh, for the citizens of the state of Ohio uh, to put in those chargers for your staff. OK, so you're in an eligible county. You've got an eligible location. Who's an eligible applicant? Um, literally, uh, we've made this uh, really broad. You, you, need, you can be an Ohio uh, business or a nonprofit uh, incorporated under Ohio law or you're registered with the Ohio Secretary of State's office. Um, the applicant can be a vendor, can be a utility or a site host. Uh, again, I just want to make that very clear. It could be a vendor, a utility or a site host based on your specific um, location or group of locations. It may make sense for one or the other to be an applicant, please feel free to reach out to me or to Carolyn to have that conversation and say, hey, we're looking at these five locations or these four or three locations, you know, we think it makes the most sense for the vendor to be the applicant or in some cases the utility to be the applicant or this, you know, so, so, so by all means have that conversation with us uh, if you want to. Um, local, state, uh, federal government entities, political subdivisions, again, it's really broad. You can be a university, you can be a community college, you could be a sewer district, a solid waste authority, anyone, every one of those uh, political subdivisions are, are um, also eligible. Uh, um, MPOs, metropolitan planning organizations, uh, are um, eligible uh, applicants as well, since our MPOs have been doing a great job of coordinating local governments and local businesses, and often have the best view of sort of a regional approach to how to deploy these charging stations. So we're really looking, we appreciate, first of all, their efforts on this front, and we're looking forward to receiving applications from them as well. And finally, any air quality or transportation organization, again, if you're partnering with a site host or a vendor, and you have sort of the best regional view of where this should go, and you're kind of facilitating this entire process, uh, you could be an applicant as well uh, for these grants. 
um, who is not eligible to apply. Generally, if you are not registered in the state with the state of Ohio, if you're not incorporated in Ohio, if um, you're an individual, you're not eligible, like you can't apply for, you know, uh, your own um, garage uh, or your own home. Um, and then if you've got like any uh, environment, like um, uh, compliance uh, issues associated with environmental compliance, labor standards or tax status or things like that, if you're in violation of Ohio laws, then you're not um, an eligible applicant. Um, the last thing I'll mention on this is that you, an, one, an applicant, as I alluded to this earlier, that an applicant may submit one grant application from multiple locations or you may separate, submit separate um, grant applications for each location. It'll make sense sometimes to do one or sometimes to do the other. Um, and, and so again, please reach out to us and kind of have that conversation with us. And, and Carolyn and I will be happy to advise you based on the situation that you described. Um, but we do expect that your application will con contain all the information that's required in sections four and five, and we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, and you, you've got to make sure that you meet all the information requirements for all of the locations. The other thing we'd like for you to make sure is if you've got multiple locations listed in one application, that you rank them by priority for us. And you say, that's this is my number one priority, this is my number two priority, and so on. So um, and just keep that in mind as well. Okay. So you're in an eligible county, um, an eligible site, and you're an eligible applicant. Uh, what costs are eligible? So it's very important for you to read section 3.4 of the RFA document very care carefully. Uh, please try to make the costs clear uh, in separate contracts, as you can see. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to read all of the seven, but generally you'll notice that anything, the charging stations themselves, and anything related to preparing that parking spot to do electric vehicle charging, we've considered eligible, right? So there's concrete work, there's painting, striping, sense, you know, the uh, paint striping, stenciling of the charging station parking spaces, there's signage associated with that. You know, we've considered those, uh, all of those um, eligible. The other big ticket item, and I've mentioned this earlier on, is that the network fees for up to five years, the manufacturer's warranty extended up to five years, the annual maintenance contract uh, for the charging equipment up to five years. All of these are eligible co costs. As a matter of fact, if you want to, it may be simplest for you to just, you know, the, the budget requires you to break out the costs. So maybe what we'll do is we'll just take a look at the, the, the one and items one, six, and seven, and those will amount to say 75% of your cost, or excuse me, 80% of your cost or 100% of your uh, eligible costs and, and we or the 7,500 or the 15,000 per port. And maybe we can, that'll make it that much simpler for us to just go ahead and, and kind of reimburse you directly for that. Now, having said that, you don't have to do it that way, uh, but we're just like, that's just a thought in terms of from a granting agency perspective of clear delineated costs and that's what we'd like for you to do is clearly delineate the cost for us in your application. So what is not eligible? Well, in the RFA, you'll see that there are literally 20 items uh, of, of ineligible costs. So do please take a look at that. But I'll just highlight a few of them. Number one, I mentioned earlier, it can be leased. It has to be purchased equipment. Number two, it has to be new. It can be used or refurbished or remanufactured equipment. Uh, then um, uh, again, it has to be accessible to the general public. So if it's for any limited use, then you, it is not eligible. Uh, we mentioned that real estate, um, you know, is not an eligible cost, whether your lease for that property, you know, great, you're going to sign a lease for that little piece of land that you're going to put the charger on, uh, that uh, would not be an eligible cost under our program. Uh, anything else, you know, constructing the actual parking building or the parking lot beyond that parking space itself, that would not be an eligible cost um, for us to reimburse. And then any general maintenance that you would do, uh, just keeping it clean, uh, repainting it after the initial, uh, you know, painting to, to designate that parking spot and so on. Anything that's considered general maintenance, we would not consider to be eligible. And the one really, really important one that I want you all to be very clear on is that any contract that you sign before you sign the grant contract with our director, 
that will not be eligible for reimbursement. So you can make all the tentative agreements. You can even have draft agreements, uh, you know, agreements drafted. But if you sign a contract before the date of the grant that you sign with us, the, the, the grant contract that you sign with us, we would not be able to uh, fund uh, that contract. So please keep that in mind. It's a very important note. Okay. So moving on, so what are some specific program requirements? Again, it's in section four of the RFA, and you'll see them listed in four categories, you know, uh, requirements for the site, requirements for the charging equipment, um, requirements for operating the charging station, and then reporting requirements uh, that come with this grant program. So let's dive into that real quick. Excuse me. So project site, we've already talked about this uh, to a great extent, um, publicly available, 16 hours a day. I do wanna point out here that they have to be safe, well lit with conveniences like food and bathrooms and so on. The more you have around your charging station, the higher your project is going to rank. Um, your site also has to be ADA compliant and obviously you need enough electrical capacity to serve the EV station. So we ask about that in the application as well. And you've got to comply with all regulations that apply. So pretty straightforward and pretty standard requirements that you would have seen elsewhere as well. In terms of the equipment, again, we've tried to keep it very simple and straightforward and follow what common level two technical standards are. I do wanna call out that we're requiring that the charging stations be networked via an open source non-proprietary communications protocol. Again, we're really looking to get as much usage out of these uh, as possible. Um, let's see what else. So um, yeah, you should allow for again, data collection and electronic payment. Uh, that's a requirement under this um, uh, grant program. Again, on for electronic payment, I wanna reiterate and I'll say it again further down is that we're not asking you to charge or not to charge a fee for using your charging station. We're just saying if you charge a fee, then you have to allow for electronic payment. And, and there's more on this uh, further down. Uh, ADA compliance, we've already talked about, you know, five years of networking, five years manufacturer's warranty, five year service contract. So we'd like for you to make sure that your charging equipment um, meets all of these um, requirements. So uh, there are further requirements as well. Just please take a look at section 4.2 um, for the complete list. Okay, so in 4.3, we talk about project implementation and operations. Uh, so you're in your application, you've got to explain to us how you're going to ensure that, for example, you're going to provide customer support, right? There, how you, you know, they've got to be clear use instructions at the chargers. You want to put a phone number there from, you know, someone's available from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., for example, uh, to assist customers if they have difficulty operating the charger, you know, and uh, you've got to guarantee an uptime of 95%. Uh, I already mentioned the interoperable open source um, non-proprietary connectors for charging, for payment options, and for communication between the equipment and the network and the vehicle. Um, so we also expect you to kind of make sure that EV drivers know when a station is down, um, you know, for whatever means that that is appropriate uh, to make sure that people are not inconvenienced by equipment that is down and they don't know that until they get there. And also we want you to protect the equipment, um, you know, and of course we've made all of those things like um, guard posts, wheel stops, curb protection, we've made those eligible costs because we want the chargers that we invest in to um, uh, have that protection, if you will. And uh, so again, I mean, a number of other requirements, but just take a look at section 4.3 um, for the full list and ask us, uh, you know, reach out to us if you have any questions. 4.4 talks about reporting requirements. And again, broadly, there are three types of reporting requirements. One set of requirements, the semi-annual um, project report uh, that you will submit, that is from when the time you sign a grant contract with us until the time that your charging station is open. Does that make sense? So, so between when you get your grant contract, now you're going out, you're bidding the job or you're signing the contract, 
Every six months, we want you to submit a simple report to us. And by the way, this is a requirement of the Volkswagen trustee. Uh, so we need you to submit a report to us saying, hey, here's what we did in the last six months. And you know, here's how far along we are, and here's how much longer we think we're gonna need. And so basically a very simple uh, semi-annual progress report, if you will. So you submit those reports until your charging station is installed and uh, it's now operational. So once it's installed and operational, you submit what's called a final project completion report. So I want it to be clear to your mind, project completion in this, uh, you know, at this time doesn't mean you're totally done with us. It means you're done with the installation of the chargers and they're now operational. Then you'll submit your invoices, you'll submit photos of the charging stations and operations and so on. You'll submit that documentation that we need for us to reimburse you uh, for the grant amount that we've already signed a contract with you on. So that's the project completion report. And then once you, after you're done with that and your charging stations are operating, for the next five years after that, every six months, we're asking that you submit a semi-annual charging station usage report. And then that basically, you know, you're submitting some aggregate data for each of the chargers and, and what's being, you know, how the chargers are being used again. You know, the main point I want to convey to you on reporting requirements is A, don't worry about it right now, because if you sign a grant contract with us, we'll give you templates for these reports. So how, you know, and, and the second thing is we actually reached out to many vendors uh, in the state and the reporting requirements that we've put in place are pretty standard reporting that you will get from your vendor anyway. Um, uh, for usage of these charging stations. So I don't want you to think of this as something really burdensome. Uh, we think of this as an important opportunity. Uh, well, some of the reporting is required because the trustee requires it. Uh, and the rest of it, the, the, the usage reporting is because this would be a great opportunity for the state of Ohio to collect this broad range of usage data for us to understand trends and, and you know, and decide how to make future investments and so on. So. With that, um, we've, you know, say you've met all the four, the four requirements for completeness. Uh, you've, you, uh, excuse me, you've re you, you're eligible. You understand what the program requirements is, and you're ready to submit an application. So, what I mentioned earlier is there's the require. The th first threshold is the threshold of eligibility. The second threshold is the threshold for completeness. These are the four parts. These are the three or four parts. If you're a governmental entity, then it's three. If you're non-government, meaning you're a nonprofit or you're a private business, okay, nonprofit or private business, both, you need to submit item number four here as well. And we'll talk about all of the four here. But the key point I want to make is we need all four of these pieces or all three of these pieces for a governmental entity for your application to be complete. So if you're having any issues with any of these four, please email us your questions early. Please don't wait till the last day or the last week to raise issues. Things are very hectic. I mentioned that earlier when grant application deadlines come close, uh, we're swamped. We love to help our applicants during the application period as well. We want to help you, but we're just so much less able to do it at that time. So take a look at all four of these pieces. If you have any questions or any reservations about any of them, please contact us as soon as you can so that we can work with you to address them. But here are the four pieces we need all four as part of your application. So the first part is the project proposal. Now the project proposal, um, you know, we have provided to you in the RFA document and on our website, the template for the project proposal. And we ask that you use the template. And let me make it very clear not using the template is a deal breaker for us. You know why? Because to fairly and consistently review and rank the different applications we will receive, we have to be able to compare the applications so we need them in a consistent format. So please, please follow and use the project proposal template downloaded from our website and fill it in. The second thing is please provide as much information as you can. We totally understand that some of your agreements may not be memorialized. 
you may not have signed a site host agreement. Some of you may not even have a site in mind just yet. I mean, you're going to take this information and you're inspired and you're empowered to go out and look for that right blend of, of a vendor, a, a site host, a utility that's willing to come together and cooperate to, to do something good here for your region and install these level two charters. So we understand that, but by the time you submit your application, please give us as much information as possible even if some of the things are not finalized. In applications that an application that has a lot of TBDs or to be determined will basically render your proposal as non-responsive. So as much information as you can provide it at the time you submit your application. So now the next few slides are a quick overview of the project proposal. So here, um, is um, like some of the, the first few things that we asked for in the project proposal. Our advice to you, by the way, is read the entire template before you fill it up, as some of the information may fit better in later questions than initial ones. So we don't want you to have to repeat the same thing multiple times. So again, say as much as you can. I never want to, you know, have think, I, I don't want you to think that you should somehow limit your responses. The more information you could, even if it's repetitive, that's fine, but I just would advise you that just read through the entire template first and then decide offline what pieces of information you're going to fill in where, and that'll help you create the most kind of well-rounded application. And again, say as much as you can uh, in your project proposal. So I know that many of you may not be able to see this clearly on your screen, but it's clear in the appendix of the RFA document, it's appendix B. Uh, and then the downloadable Word file that you can download and literally fill out your application there and attach additional sheets of paper to, you know, additional text to that form uh, as you go. So, for example, I want to call your attention to how the applicant information itself. There are literally four roles that we want to make sure that we are talking to the right person for the right thing. A grant writer, for example, is could be a consultant or could be the vendor. Uh, versus the authorizing agent. Now that's the person in the applicant's organization that's going to sign the grant application and is also the person that signs the grant contract. You're signing these certifications, so you're putting your name on the line, right? And you're swearing to all of these things, that's the authorizing agent. Uh, versus the fiscal agent, that's the person that submits the reports and the reimbursement request. If there are questions about dollars here, dollars there, and so on, that's who we, you know, uh, would we think would know uh, and be the right person. And finally, the project director. The project director is the person that's quarterbacking this project, especially if there are multiple entities involved. So if we have questions during the application review, we want, you know, we we want to know who the number one person to call is for this project and that would be your project director. So uh, the one point I'd make here is that the same person can't be in all four roles. You can be in more than one role, you can be in two roles for that matter. You can be the grant writer and the project director, for example, but you can't be in all four roles. So just keep that in mind. That doesn't give a granting agency a warm, fuzzy feeling when the same person is filling all four roles. OK, and then, you know, we asked for some project information, uh, some very basic information here that you see the budget table. A couple of important things to point out to you. Uh, please make the, you know, distinguish between the total project cost versus eligible cost. We already talked about what's eligible and what's not eligible, and it's in the RFA document as well. So what's the total project cost? What's the eligible cost versus how much funding of the eligible cost are you asking us for? What are we getting through this? You know what the point that we want to get to is we want to be able to rank an application by the dollars we invest per charger made available to the public. Let me say that again. It's dollar invested per charger port made available to members of the public. So just because you're eligible for 100% doesn't mean you should ask for 100%, right? Uh, you know, to make you know your project more cost efficient, you may want to think about that a little bit. Or just because you're eligible for 80%, do you really want to ask for 80%? Uh, because at the end of the day, one, the, 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 one of the primary ranking criteria is how many dollars are we investing to make that one, that next charger port available to members uh, uh, you know, of Ohio citizenry, right? 
So keep that in mind. The other important note on this is that um, it's important that your project budget here match the project budget in Appendix D of the RFA. So they're sort of this this table is identical in both places. Please make sure that you're you know you you make sure that the the information in both cases matches. Uh, we ask for a quick project summary. Uh, you know, we actually list an example. They're really simple, basic summary. Think of this as something we would copy and paste in a, in a, for public consumption in a small news story or uh, something like something very basic, non-technical. So the example we provide is this project will install two level two dual port charging stations with four connections for four publicly accessible electric vehicle parking spaces at ABC Public Library located in this city or village at the intersection of this street and this road, right? Literally that simple a project summary. Uh, an important note is that if you've got multiple sites in your application, then please include one paragraph for each of those locations. Next, we ask for some basic site information. Uh, we want you to name a site, uh, your site, whatever you call it, especially if it's uh, if you're submitting multiple site locations um, in one application. Please make sure that each one has a name and address and you tell us whether it's a government or non government owned property and, and whatever basic description you include here. Uh, you know, information on the site host. Uh, you know, again, it's pretty self-explanatory as well as the utility. So we actually ask for contact information for a utility person because again, we want to make sure that you have coordinated, you know, not just, you know, it's not just a vendor or just a site host or just a utility, but all three entities have actually coordinated on this proposal. The next set of information that you'll see uh, that the project proposal asks for again, uh, if you've got a vendor selected already, we're interested in knowing uh, who that is. If you've got, um, uh, uh, you know, a financial structure, we're just interested. In some cases, it may be really simple, uh, like one entity owns and operates the charging stations, and the other one is the site host, and it's as simple as that. But we just want to, do, you know, add a few sentences here that tells us what uh, the arrangement is for the ownership. Uh, in terms of or the financial structure for the site location. And again, multiple site location means multiple kind of narratives, if you will, explaining that. Um, the next one is a map of the proposed location. So now think of this sort of as a street map. We just want to know where it's at. We want to know what the building next to it is. We want to know what street it's on. Just think of it as a typical street map and where it is on that. And also in the narrative, you can describe, you know, where it's at and why it's suitable for this uh, this project. Then next we ask for um, uh, information. Uh, many other states, um, they require AADT information to get a sense of how busy this location is uh, from a traffic standpoint. We actually adopted the recommendation of our sister agency, ODOT, and instead chose to prioritize based on the highest functional class road within a quarter of mile of your proposed location. So the highest functional class road within a quarter mile of the location that you have proposed. So there's a way to generate a map using ODOT's uh, TIM system and uh, where you can show what that higher, highest functional class is. So, you know, basically saying what's the busiest road within a quarter mile of where you're proposing to put these chargers. Um, the detailed instructions for um, generating this map is in the appendices of the RFA. I myself did a test run and it took me less than five minutes, less than five minutes to generate a map. So please understand that this is a pretty simple, straightforward uh, way to do this with detailed instructions from ODOT on how to generate this map. And it should take you five minutes or less to do it and then print out the map included in the PDF uh, of your application when you submit it to us. So that again, we have the same basis to compare uh, between different applicants. Uh, next up, we ask for a diagram or a schematic of the parking spaces themselves. So please, you know, show us, you know, where the space is within that garage, within that lot, 
you know, where's the charging equipment going to be located? Where's the electric service to the site? You know, where's the point of sale equipment, if there is any? So just kind of show us in that schematic. I do want to point out that we do not expect you to generate engineering plans for this. We want to keep this as simple and straightforward at the application process as, as possible. So it's just a schematic that's showing where everything else, not detailed engineering plans. Um, and then after that, we're asking you for the type of equipment uh, that, that you're, of course, you're going to install level two equipment, but this is what you described, single port, dual port, what other specifications, uh, you know, apply, uh, section 4.2, uh, is an important kind of uh, reference, go to that section and answer the questions that are there and say, this is how we meet this and this and this and this so that we are able to see that all the equipment requirements uh, have been met. Some more uh, sort of the last third, if you will, of um, information that's required in the application. Um, so tell us about project implementation and charging station operations, right? So how are you going to operate the charging station? Again, section 4.3, we talked about this, uh, the implementation and, and project and operations section. I would advise you go to that section and kind of answer every requirement that's listed here in the box and how you're going to meet it. Uh, I will reiterate for you, the Ohio EPA is not requiring that you impose a fee or a rate structure for users of your chargers. You can choose to charge for charging or you can choose to make it free. It's either way, it's up to you. But two things. One is if you make it free, then that provides and that, that creates an extra onus for you to tell us how are you going to make sure that people aren't just monopolizing your charger, right? And, and, and you're truly really getting utility. It's a challenge that um, hosts face everywhere, not just in Ohio, but across the country. And there isn't one, you know, there isn't sort of a, a, a silver bullet, if you will, for that yet. But, but just place emphasis on that. And if you are charging, please tell us what your charging structure is or your fee structure is going to be like so that we can, um, we have an understanding of what your fee structure is. Okay, um, the next one just talks about your utility. Um, you know, again, what kind of electric services exist for the site? What upgrade must be need? Do you need any upgrades for this? And of course, it's that's a bigger deal with, with um, fast charging, uh, but any upgrades that may be needed, any cost estimates associated with that, it's just very, very basic information. Again, it just demonstrates to us that you've done the necessary coordination with your local utility and you have a representative you're working with and you've already listed the name of that representative back in item number three and um, so on. So just just make sure that makes sh that shows us that you've engaged with your local utility. Um, then we ask here for a status of necessary permits or other approvals. Uh, again, you see a broad list of uh, possible permits that may be required and a blank for other that we may not even have thought of. Uh, so just where are you in the process? Just go ahead and check the box and include text explaining anything here. The important thing that I want you to take away from this is this is not a deal breaker again. If you don't even know where you're going right now, that's fine. But by the time you submit the application, where are you in this general structure of things? We understand that even after you apply, there's a time for us to review applications and rank them and so on, and you move further along. But at the same time, you checking these boxes will give us a sense of, of uh, where things are in terms of project development on your end. Um, finally, uh, we uh, we are asking for an estimated project schedule or a timeline. Again, we understand this is from when you know where you're at right now, uh, and and you can obviously factor in the grant uh, timing and so on into the timeline that you provide. We understand again that this is tentative at best at this point and is subject to change. And then uh, at the end, I mentioned the authorizing agent. This is where the authorizing agent provides their name and signature and their contact information and everything. Again, they're the ones that are putting their line. They're the ones that we're going to sign the grant contract with. Uh, so be sure that the right person in the applicant's entity is the authorizing uh, agent uh, on this. So that was the uh, project uh, uh, template, if you will, the application template. The next uh, thing that I want to call your attention to is the project budget. 
Uh, again, uh, please make sure that what's in the application is consistent with what's in the project budget template. Um, and uh, please go over it, uh, mention um, uh, like the different costs that are associated with it. For example, if you take a closer look at it, you'll see that we're asking you, uh, for example, to make a distinction between the total estimated project cost. We're asking you what other funding sources are you going to be using? Uh, then we're asking you, we're listing what we consider eligible costs. So the second table that you see on there is what the Ohio EPA considers VW eligible. Not that the other costs are not worthy costs, they are, but these are the costs that, that would be eligible for VW funding. And then we add up, you know, what the uh, total eligible costs are of that total cost, what amount all or some of that you're going to ask for from the Ohio EPA, a DMTF grant program. So then we divide one with the other from the other, and then we figure out what percentage are you asking for from us, you know, so that makes sure whether you're at the 80% mark or the 100% mark, and depending on government or non-government. And then based on that, we, you know, you will tell us per charging port and that, so you count one for a single port, two for a dual port chargers, you add them all up. So per charging port, how many dollars are you asking us for? And that's, like I said, that's the ultimate number that we're trying to get to. And, and that will help us decide, um, you know, all of the things being okay, that'll help us decide also how to rank the applications by cost effectiveness. And then the third part uh, is the certification statement. Again, um, it's, um, you know, it's it's a standard uh, EPA VW DMTF certification statement for some of you that are not, you know, used to granting agencies or certainly government granting agencies. It may seem a little bit long, but it's important. Trust us, we try to make it as short as possible, uh, but at the same time, make sure we cover all the bases. The authorizing agent must sign this. Uh, and I'm sorry, we weren't able to provide an e-signature provision, so we're going to need you to sign it then scan it and submit it with the rest of your uh, application proposal. So there's a look at the certification statement, the first page, it runs into multiple pages. Again, please read it carefully. If you have any questions, again, just you know, email myself or email Carolyn and we'd be happy to, to talk uh, with any of the provisions about any of the provisions with you. And then finally, if you're a private sector or a nonprofit applicant, then uh, requirement number four for financial uh, requirement also applies. Again, you know, we want to simply make sure that you have the ability to cover upfront the cost of the entire project while you're awaiting reimbursement. So there are two ways to do that. You can submit an acceptable credit rating like as listed on that table, uh, or you can submit a letter from your financial institution, you know, documenting, you know, the things that are listed again and on that table. Excuse me. Okay, so once you've submitted an application and it's complete, and now we're ranking those, correct? So here's a list of, of, of ranking criteria that we're going to be using. Um, and again, you know, some other states, they tend to provide you with a rubric with 10 points for this and five points for that. We intentionally decided not to, and we want to keep it relatively flexible, but comprehensive. So these are the things that you want to keep in mind as you're preparing your proposal. Uh, cost effectiveness, I've already mentioned that a few times. So, um, you know, just keep in mind again, it's, you know, it's the DMTF funded share of the total project cost described in the application. So it's how many dollars do we invest per charger port? So that's why we encourage you to provide a strong local match uh, to the extent that you can to score higher on cost effectiveness. Uh, availability, uh, you've got to be available a minimum of 16 hours a day. That is your prime business and daylight hours. But if you're open for 20 hours or 24 hours, you're accessible to the public, then you score higher. Um, relative location is where, um, where are you relative to the next nearest publicly available charger? We're going to figure that out on our end. We're not asking you to submit something on that. We'll look it up. But I just want you to know that if you're in a location that's relatively high traffic, but at the same time, it's further away from other publicly available chargers, then you're likely to score higher. Like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to fill gaps here. 
Uh, traffic, we already mentioned uh, what's the highest uh, functional class road within a quarter of a mile of your uh, proposed location. So the higher the functional class road within the quarter of a mile, the higher your, process, your, your proposal will rank. Amenities, uh, we need you to have restrooms, food, you know, restaurants, retail shopping. So the busier the location, the higher you're likely to rank. Although again, if you're in a location, as long as you have something there, don't let that be a deterrent for you to apply. Like even if it's just one restaurant and 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 so on, one a few businesses, you know, please go ahead and apply because you know, as with all grant programs, ultimately it's a matter of how many grant applications are received and and you know, what the level of competitiveness is. So please do apply. Uh, multiple chargers, meaning if you've got more than one charger, more than one port, uh, then you uh, get a higher priority. Um, scalability along the same lines. If you've got a site location and you tell us that you've prepped the site to install more charging stations, uh, more chargers further down the road, then those would get a higher priority as well. Again, another reason to have that regional co uh, you know, uh, conversation with uh, your, your, your MPO, your planning office for your city or your village or your county, you know, to have sort of a strategy there. Uh, state term service contract, I mentioned that earlier. If you're a public entity and you use DAS's contract, then um, you'll rank higher. Um, and finally, if you're a destination location in Ohio, and those destination locations are in the Drive Ohio's um, siting study, then we'll give you a higher priority. Uh, the applications will be reviewed by Ohio EPA staff as well as looked at by ODOT staff. Um, so there'll be a committee that will be reviewing and ranking these. We also have the right to look at your past performance. If you've gotten a grant from us before, did you actually you know, do a good job with that grant or not uh, and make good progress? Uh, so those are all factors that also uh, play a role in our decision. So with that, to recap, um, you know, you've got to be eligible. So we discussed that. Then you've got to submit a complete application and here are the three or four government or versus non-government you know criteria or components of your application that we need to see and you've got to please try and submit good information solid information and the better your information and the better written your application is the more likely you are to receive a higher ranking so with that, there's only one way to submit an application. That is to fill out your project proposal template, your project budget, to generate your maps, to get your certification statements signed and scan all of those into one PDF file and email that to evcharging at epa.ohio.gov. evcharging at epa.ohio.gov by 3 p.m. on September 30th. That's the way to get your application in. If you can get it in a day, two, three days earlier, that would be great. So you're, uh, you know, you're you're kind of protecting yourself from you know server downtimes and 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 so on, or you know high traffic or on the, on the internet traffic, if you will. Um, so, but that's the way to get it in. One PDF. You combine all these components into one PDF and submit it via email to evcharging at epa.ohio.gov. And uh, my contact information is up there. Uh, Carolyn's is up there as well. Um, please, um, you know, I want to say that like this, uh, um, uh, please take the opportunity. Please contact us if you have any questions and um, and, um, you know, reach out to us with any questions and please apply. I mean, this is one of the rare opportunities. I'm not aware of many other opportunities for public funding, grant funding to help you put a charger on your property in your county. So this is one of those rare opportunities. And Carolyn and I really approach this with sort of a partnership mindset uh, with our businesses and communities and our vendors and everybody is part of like helping move the needle forward for level two EV charging uh, in Ohio. And hopefully we'll do the same with DC fast charging further down the road. So please go ahead and uh, ask us any questions and we look forward to you applying. I just want to reiterate the point I made earlier on. I mean, literally Carolyn, myself, Alan, Ryan, our entire group at, at the Ohio EPA, we view this program as our partnership with Ohio communities, businesses, with our vendors. We have a solid group of vendors here in Ohio right now 
contractors, planning organizations. We're blessed with some of the best MPOs that that you know in our state. Uh, so we look at all of us working together to actually deploy level two EV charging stations in a way that both serves current EV owners and it encourages non-owners to consider an electric vehicle. And this eventually gets us all cleaner air in Ohio. So we can only get there if we get as many solid, well thought, well articulated and cost effective applications as possible across the 26 counties. So please apply. Please don't hesitate to ask us questions or explain your challenges to us early in the application period. Please send us email, you know, call us only if it's absolutely kind of urgent or necessary. Otherwise, send us an email and again, keep your eye out for the posting of this uh, um, uh, PowerPoint as well as the recording and an FAQ document. You know, please share it with other, other entities in your counties as well. Um, that's basically it. So we look forward to receiving your application, to receiving your questions and to partnering with you. As you know, when we're done with this, Ohio should take a significant step forward uh, in terms of EV charging infrastructure in our state. Thank you. All right, we have not received any more questions, so we will pull the webinar to a close at this time. Thank you everyone for participating today and for giving us those good head scratcher questions. We will be as allowed and said, working on getting those posted. And for those of you who are interested in the other grant opportunity we have open uh, at this time, we are updating uh, the website questions and answers that are published about the vehicle replacement grant opportunity uh, on a regular basis, at least once every one to two weeks. So if you are interested in applying to that, please check that website as well. Thank you again for participating and we look forward to seeing your applications. Aladdin, back to you. No, just want to add my thanks as well. Thank you, Carolyn, and, and everybody in the background for helping uh, us with these webinars. So we're raring to go. We're looking forward to the questions and the applications. All right, thank you. We are signing off. <laughs>